Our next speaker, uh, Professor Jim Coleman, uh, has been a colleague and friend of uh, uh, Eli for over uh, two decades, and uh, uh, both of them have been doing uh, pioneering work in uh, quantum wave lasers, particularly strain quantum wave lasers. Uh, Jim uh, joined the faculty of uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign nearly three decades ago. Uh, before that, uh, he has been with uh, Bell Lab and uh, Rockwell. He has uh, been most well known for his pioneering work on uh, MOCVD growth, and particularly the MOCVD growth of strain quantum wave lasers, and many interesting physics uh, that are discovered from uh, his uh, strain quantum wave lasers. Uh, let's welcome Jim. Thank you. Is the microphone on? Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Ming and, and Eli. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, try to uh, capture the uh, impact of strain quantum wave lasers. And to do that uh, um, in a few minutes is uh, is nearly impossible. But I'll I'll take a shot at it. Uh, I've I've uh, studied strain for long periods of time, but there's nothing quite like the strain of being the last speaker before lunch. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I can manage the physics easier than that. But to, to try and make it a little bit easier, I'm going to start by giving you a pre-lunch quiz. <laughs> and uh, so as, as I go along here, I want you to look for clues to the answers of how Eli might be related to a Civil War general, a 1930s uh, surgical suite, a rock band, and you've probably had a few hints about large piles of money, but we'll uh, <laughs> somewhere along the line you'll find some clues to all of that. Okay. So the, the, the concept of strain layers is really a very simple, but given uh, the historical context, a very elegant concept, and that is you know, we all learned this in the first few days of graduate school, what this looked like, and realized that despite its apparent complexity, this is a symmetric structure. And really until we started talking about strain layers in the, the third or fourth decade of semiconductor research, everything prior to that was constrained by the symmetry. Well, Eli asked the question, what happens if you make it asymmetric? And uh, as a theorist, he didn't have to worry about how to do that. Uh, but th the question quickly becomes, can you distort the unit cell? How would you do that? And then what happens when you do? So uh, the, 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 the result is the concept of strain accommodation. And that's to think of, you know, we always thought of semiconductors as basically rocks, things that were, were solid, immovable objects. But they, they aren't completely inflexible. In fact, they, they have a small degree of elasticity, but it's just generally so small that it, 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 it wasn't really apparent or something, something to consider. And uh, a good example, and, and, and maybe the, the poster child example, is indium gallium arsenide, for reasons that will become clear in a minute. The unit cell, even at 50% indium gallium arsenide, is 3.6% is larger than that of gallium arsenide. Now, 3.6% doesn't sound like a lot if you're looking at your annual pay raise, but 3.6% in mismatch between two crystalline materials is enormous. Um, so if you could do this, if you could uh, put this into a layered structure, that would lead to tetragonal distortion. And this is shown sort of in this cartoon of if you take the unit cell and it's disembodied, it's, it's larger by 3.6%, of course, exaggerated here. If you put that onto a host of gallium arsenide, it will be compressed in the plane in two directions. And then if you further envelop that in, a, in another layer of gallium arsenide, it will be constrained at both interfaces, and uh, the, uh, the atoms will be compressed in the plane, but they'll also elongate because generally the volume doesn't change much, and it's sort of like a balloon. If you want to squeeze it at the bottom, it's going to extend to some, to some extent, um, which is actually Poisson's ratio, 
in, in the, uh, in the uh, tension direction. So what, what becomes clear then, and, and uh, this actually goes back to, to earlier work, is if, if it is mismatched, the strain can be accommodated elastically within the limits of the material without the formation of dislocations if the layer is thin enough. And the maximum layer thickness for, for this elastic strain accommodation has been called the, the critical thickness. The part of the, the answer to why this had impact and the timing is so important is keep in mind the time of this work is just really when quantum wells and really thin layers are becoming practically available. So what this means is that if you can make the layer thin enough, the, the layer can be, can be stretched and pushed in such a way that the strain is accommodated elastically, but if it's not, it will relax, and when it does that, it does that by forming misfit dislocations, which then propagate through the material. From the point of view of an optical device, that's really a very undesirable thing. So um, this critical thickness was described earlier in a, in a, a body of work uh, involving uh, J.W. Matthews and Gene Blakesley uh, at IBM. And what they did was they looked at balancing the forces, the force contained in the stressed or strained crystal versus the, the amount of force it took to relax into a dislocation. You balance those to find the critical thickness, which is a transcendental equation you see here. And if you plot that out for something familiar, which is indium gallium arsenide on a, on a gallium arsenide host, it looks like this. So this is the critical thickness versus composition for three circumstances. One is the single layer where all the strain is in, in one interface, a quantum well where it's in two interfaces, or the super lattice where the, there is a, a companion uh, uh, expansion of the gallium arsenide with compression of the indium gallium arsenide, and it, they, they all release the energy and distribute it in different ways distribute in different ways. The most important thing to take away from this is for any amount of indium, the layers have to be very small. And so th that is an indication and it arises from the fact that the elasticity is not much. There is some, but there's not much. But remember, time frame is that we're starting to use more and more quantum wells and so the concept of using a thin layer is, is not out of the question. So here's your first hint. This has something to do with a rock band. Okay. Well, what are the strain effects? And this is, is exactly what uh, Eli reported. If you take a lattice matched uh, circumstance, you have a, for, for a compound semiconductor like gallium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, you have a conduction band, and nothing much happens to that when you strain it. But the valence band is very complex because you have a combination of, of S and P orbitals. The S orbitals are not directional, but, uh, but the P orbitals are. So when you start twisting and changing the unit cell, you have most effect on the valence band. And in fact, what looks like an ordinary uh, uh, degenerate light hole and heavy hole valence bands become distorted. And you have to consider now two directions. The effective directions are the one that's in the plane uh, or the one that's orthogonal to the plane. So you have the parallel and perpendicular cases. In the case of compressive strain, like indium gallium arsenide, you squeeze it down in the, in the, in the plane, in plane effective masses. First of all, the degeneracy is removed. Well, that's not a big deal because they're already removed in quantum wells. We'd already been doing that in lattice match quantum well systems. But most importantly, this what looks like a heavy hole band becomes a lot lighter. And that, that's the key feature. Uh, of course, there's a companion case, and that is the, uh, the case of, of tension, where you put tension in the, in, the, uh, in the plane, so you have compression in the uh, perpendicular plane. And symmetry argues that the changes are just what you see, and it, you know, Mother Nature drives towards symmetry so that you see the symmetric effects here. So 
strain has a pronounced effect on the valence band structure of the 3-5 materials. In particular, it removes a degeneracy, interesting but not so important, but uh, changes in the effective masses are the key feature that, that has such a strong impact on semiconductor lasers. So that shows up in uh, uh, a somewhat younger looking uh, Eli and his uh, co-worker uh, Evan Kane on the reduction of lacing threshold current density. This is the key. There's the valence band and, and they predicted correctly and exactly uh, the, the, the main point which is if I want to minimize the threshold in a semiconductor laser, I want those two effective masses to be the same and I want them to be as small as possible. And if I can do that, there is, there is benefit that comes to me. There are many others that were more of a surprise. And there's a couple of more clues we're going to find about some of these guys a little bit later. Uh, you probably won't see where this one is going. So, to, this idea didn't get traction immediately. You know, people in 1986 didn't drop what they were doing and start making strain layers because there is an enormous driving force of conventional wisdom that said you can do anything you want with any semiconductor combination you want, with any growth technology you want, as long as all the layers are lattice matched. And in fact, uh, early work by uh, Jerry Stringfellow, who uh, was at HP at that time, said the importance of lattice match, and his particular case was for indium gallium phosphide because HP had an interest in, in visible uh, semiconductors, was that your composition has to be within uh, 1%. And to show this, here's one that's only 3 tenths of a percent mismatched, and you can see all the dislocations that form. Well, admittedly, that's a, that's a thick layer. In fact, when I got to Bell Labs, the first week I was at Bell Labs, I had a discussion with my boss at Bell, who was Mort Panish, about strain compensation. Um, and there's a key point here that says, owing to the potentially deleterious effects of grown in stresses on the performance and lifetimes, meaning reliability, of heterojunction lasers, they were intentionally adding a tiny fraction of tenths of a percent of composition of phosphorus so that the layers would be mismatched at the growth temperature in aluminum gallium arsenide, which is, you know, nearly lattice matched over the whole range, they'd add enough phosphorus so it would be mismatched at the growth temperature so then when it cooled down to room temperature, the, 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 even the tiny amount of mismatch that's in the, the natural system would be eliminated. And, and tracking that back onto, uh, onto laser reliability. So uh, a little bit after, the, after uh, Eli's paper, we started uh, working on, on indium gallium arsenide, mainly to, to, to calibrate a new MOCVD system to work on, on quaternary alloys. And uh, one of the components was indium, so we started putting indium into these layers and thought, well, you know, they won't work very well and they'll have a lot of dislocations. And there had been some experimental and papers reported about how you put indium in and the, the lasers die, they're, they're flash bulbs and so on. We thought, all right, well, we'll put some indium in there anyway and uh, at least we can calibrate these things before they die. And uh, two uh, stark observations happened almost right away. One is they didn't die. They lived as long as we used them. And secondly, there was a huge drop in the threshold current uh, density as we introduced indium into the well, provided that the layers were not thicker than the critical thickness. Uh, this alone wouldn't have changed anybody's mind about anything, but then we also had a collaboration going with colleagues at uh, McDonnell Douglas, and uh, I, I didn't put it on here, but I'm pretty sure that that Elmsford plant was also a spin-off from Exxon, wasn't it? Uh, that I don't recall. Okay. I, I could not find any evidence of that, uh, but I, I, I believe it was, but in any case. Uh, 
McDonnell Douglas was interested in making uh, uh, lasers. They had a, a big contract with the government to make uh, lasers to use as fuses. And uh, we were working on the strain layers, and they had reliability concerns. So we put some lasers together at three different uh, thicknesses for the same composition. These were all 1.06 micron lasers. Uh, below the critical thickness, at the critical thickness, and uh, just above the critical thickness. And the conclusions were, again, start. The, uh, the ones above the critical thickness were flash bulbs, intermediate results for those right near the critical thickness, and very long life for those that were uh, below the critical thickness. And later, this was extended to 1.1 microns and out to thousands of hours. And of course, it's, that's a well-known phenomenon. Same, same group of people. OK. Um, It's nice to have a, a, a great idea that then turns out to be right. I'm sure Eli will agree with that. It's nice to do some experiments that then are recognized as proving a great idea. That's a nice thing, too. But there's nothing like having a killer app show up. And the real thing that pushed strain layers clearly into the the, the mainstream of the technical world was the erbium dope fiber amplifier and the fact that uh, 980 is essentially unreachable in any lattice match system. Now there actually is one, aluminum, gallium, indium, arsenide, but those materials are really difficult to make and if there had been a good technical reason they would have gotten traction and they haven't. Uh, but the EDFA is uh, overwhelmingly now com pumped with both uh, 1440 and 980 uh, simultaneous pumping of them. Uh, but the 980 pumps are, are capable of higher power and, and more efficiency. So that's the pump of choice if you only had to choose one. And then you see the, the clue here, the stack of money in the corner. OK, so what are the implications of strain layer lasers? Um, all right, maybe I'm enlarging on this a little bit, but um, you know, uh, you can please give me the benefit of the doubt. Um, clearly, the introduction of strain engineering became a common thing. And you heard Axel talking about strain engineering within the silicon photonic system, in the silicon electronic system. It's part of your microprocessors these days. Uh, adding a little bit of germanium to a silicon layer to change the mobility in ways that enhance your FET. Strain engineering is, is uh, acceptable and clearly uh, even desirable. Uh, so using intentional lattice mismatch as a design tool is, is the obvious offshoot of that. Uh, one uh, clear cut advantage is the uh, important new wavelength ranges from uh, especially in that range from uh, from 900 to 1100 nanometers for lots and lots of applications. Um, what was acceptable reliability for strain layer since people expected them to be dying in front of your eyes that the fact that there was acceptable reliability was one step, but the, the, the next step was people started incorporating indium intentionally because it turns out to be a, re, a reliability enhancement, even in tiny quantities. So we always knew that the uh, indium phosphide based 1.5 micron lasers were always more reliable inherently than, uh, than gallium arsenide lasers, but uh, now you can add uh, microscopic amounts of indium just to make your lasers last longer and try not to change the structure very much. And of course, uh, um, the EDFA is a critical component in all light wave systems. I think that you could argue that uh, the drive uh, to indium is, is really the basis from, for aluminum-free uh, high-powered lasers, high-reliability, high-power lasers. Um, not so much, you know, getting rid of the aluminum is part of it, but inserting indium instead is, uh, is the advantage. And then, of course, strain compensated device designs. Now we use compressive and tensile strains. We can change polarization. We can sum the strains and have them cancel. There's a, there's a lot of opportunity to do that. And, and, it, and it may be a stretch, but I honestly believe that this 
mindset of, of, of getting out of the lockstep with lattice match has allowed lots of heterogeneous materials and mixed systems, um, including quantum dots. And, and by that I mean quantum dots are, are made uh, in 3.5, uh, the compound semiconductor quantum dots are generally made by growing something that's a two-dimensional strain layer that at some point uh, the strain starts to exceed that critical thickness and it transforms from a two-dimensional uh, layer by layer growth into a three-dimensional uh, uh, growth. And, and actually most uh, three, five semiconductor quantum dots aren't really dots. They're, they're thin layers, thin strain layers with, with bumps on them from the, the transition from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. So it becomes layer to island growth. It has this so-called wetting layer, which really doesn't work chemically in that way. And then this is just one example of uh, if you do a literature search on quantum dots, um, it'll get something like 80,000 hits. Okay. So I promised you I'd give you answers to the quizzes. And uh, the first, this is, this is what happens when you have to prepare a talk on the impact of something, and uh, you've got Wikipedia at hand, so, uh, so bear with me. First of all, this is uh, Major General Thomas L. Kane, who was a, a hero of the Battle of Gettysburg and was given uh, a, a bunch of land in Pennsylvania. And his son is Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane. Um, we have, we've all had ideas, you know, we're, we, we're talking about some of Eli's ideas today, but we're only talking about the good ones. We've all had ideas that weren't so good. And uh, Evan O'Neill Kane's idea, he had a brief uh, bout of fame here where he did his own appendectomy. Uh, so he was, had a local anesthetic and did his own appendectomy, and this is him performing the appendectomy, and apparently a few hours later he was back on his feet performing surgery. It's an idea that really hasn't caught on. <laughs> okay. Now I showed you the picture of the rock band. This is not just any rock band. This is the Dave Matthews band, and it's, it's absolutely true that Dave Matthews is the son of J.W. Matthews of the Matthews and Blakesley model. So there's probably more money in being a rock musician than there is in being a metallurgist. And the pile of money could have been a variety of things, but the one that, uh, the staggering one that I wanted to mention was the $7 billion for the EDFA market in uh, 2004 alone. Now that's not for the lasers, that's for the whole, whole product line. Um, but that's, uh, that's, if you want to have an impact, $7 billion ought to get your, get your attention. So with that, I'll say thank you and happy birthday, Eli. Talk and uh, time for questions, comments. What's for lunch is the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember the strain quantum wells uh, in the early days, as you pointed out, uh, that uh, reliability was always a concern. And when do you see it's a turning point? Actually, people view it as uh, potentially more reliable. Laser. The, uh, the answer to that is when, honestly, when people were able to measure the thickness of thinner quantum wells more accurately. Because I think some early reports uh, um, overestimated the, uh, or underestimated the thickness of their quantum wells, assumed that they should be within the critical thickness, and they were probably thicker or had more indium or something because then they turned out to be unreliable. And you know, if your expectations are that it's going to be unreliable and then somebody, you know, a few people report that they are unreliable, you're pretty happy to walk away and go to the next problem. And so actually we weren't the first to visit this experimentally, but I think we were probably the first to get good results experimentally and uh, that I think is what really made the difference, and and it's it's you know there's a there's a great de degree of luck, but we did have access to good TEM and had a, a pretty uh, pr 
pretty clear idea what those wells were in terms of the relative to the critical thickness. So, uh, yeah, not going to the opportunity. no, no, I, I, I just want to make sure everybody understands uh, the reference to the uh, Civil War general and the doctor operating on himself. Uh, the, the reference is my co author on that paper was Evan Kane. I did not realize uh, that he was de descended from a Civil War general. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and his father. What can you say? <laughs> Actually, I think it was his grandfather, but uh, you know, it's... One nice thing about working in semiconductors is you don't have to explain your mistakes to the next of kin. <laughs> okay, uh, with that, let's thank uh, Professor Coleman again.